Welcome back to the Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. This week, we have Jeff Van Gundy as the big get. Uh, so you'll have that in a few minutes. But we, as always, we're going to go who's up, who's down. Then we're going to hit our topics. We got FanDuel, Pat McAfee, Amazon getting into uh, studio shows. Jimmy Pitaro and ESPN spending ESPN Saturday, Monday night football, double header. That's a mouthful MLS final and their upcoming deal. John Oren had some predictions in his newsletter uh, and then we'll have our calls of the week. John, let's start off with who's up and who's down. Who's up? Who's down? Who's up? Jimmy Pitaro. Every single profile of uh, Bob Chapek that I've been reading, the most recent one coming from the Financial Times, shows that he has a lot of support for not only Pitaro, but ESPN. All of these stories are focused on his relationship with Hollywood, but the undercurrent within all of these stories is that he's a big supporter of ESPN and all of these rumors that ESPN is about to get spun off, it's not gonna happen anytime soon. And let me continue on with On the Way Down, You said it, Andrew, in the media, you like to build people up just to tear them down. Dick Vital has gotten call the week twice by me, but he's my on the way down. And it's based on his reaction to Maryland basketball coach Mark Turgeon quitting on the Terps and and leaving in the middle of the season. Look, I get Dick Vital and Mark Few, the Gonzaga coach. They all want to support college basketball coaches. But I'm a fan. I want to hear from the fans' perspective. They're painting Maryland fans as this unruly mob, which we are. It's great. That's usually, you know, you, you want passion uh, uh, among your fan base. And I think one of the reasons that you're on the way up, just signed a four-year, $120 million deal. And one of the reasons that Barstool is so popular is that they figured out how to talk to the fans and how to get the fans' voice. All right. So, well, you already gave away my who's up. Uh, I didn't say who it was, though, Andrew. I didn't actually say well, who it was. how many $120 million deals are there out there? The largest sports media uh, contract for a personality, as far as we know, uh, in the history of this stuff. Uh, Pat McAfee signs it with FanDuel last week. It's announced it's a four-year deal. McAfee can opt out after three years. What a rise for McAfee retiring uh, just three or four years ago. And now with this big deal, here's the thing about it. Th- it's not like this is you're signing with ESPN here. It's more of a sponsor sponsorship agreement. When you talk about these gambling, a lot of these gambling deals, uh, they're going to have their logo fan duel in the right hand corner of uh, McAfee show as they already did. Also McAfee, you know, mentions them all the time. You can see why it works for them. I've heard, you know, very large figures that they, the return on investment. So he was making eight to $10 million. I was told according to sources. Uh, and now he goes uh, to, and I've been told it's a little bit higher than what's been reported in the $30 million a year. could be semantics, but uh, uh, an amazing deal for McAfee. So he's on the way up. Am I on the way down? Urban Meyer. Here's a guy who uh, was living a good life, uh, doing a uh, big noon kickoff. I uh, was getting nice reviews cushy lifestyle. Now he goes to the Jaguars and uh, struggling. And the reason it's a media story to me is because if he were to get fired or to resign with the Jaguars, I think there's a pretty good chance that he'd be back on big noon kickoff next year if he uh, is not back with the Jaguars. Yeah, you know, failure of a season. There's been the off the field incidences that have really hurt. But I know before he left, he was really well liked by Brad Zager, by Eric Shanks. And so the idea that they bring him back, despite how this this year or this season went, I think is a pretty good bet. Yeah, the Fox, top Fox sports executives definitely liked him more than his assistant coaches. <laughs> and we'll get into that well, NFL.com. My call of the week has nothing to do with that NFL.com story by Tom Palisaro. Uh, so we'll get that in a minute. Well, let's get into the topics. Uh, topic number one. Pat McAfee, four years, 120 million. You said it might be even more than a 120 million deal with uh, FanDuel. You wrote about this in your Post Plus newsletter. What can you tell us about this deal that we don't already know? Well, when you look at the reasoning behind it, I I think when FanDuel looks at McAfee, they just see someone who's unique in the space in that 
Obviously, he's already created a rabid audience, but he's actually a gambler. So it's it's really organic. Like you look at what you know their rivals, DraftKings. They have Dan Lebitard, who they you know gave a reported fifty million dollars to three year deal. Now he has a big reach, number one podcast. But Lebitard is not as much about sports. It's kind of making fun of sports. They talk about it a little bit. McAfee, on the other hand, is more. This is the game I'm betting on. Uh, this is how you guys can bet on it. So it feel that's a little more organic. I've heard some numbers, not confirmed, of what they see. It's a lot more than thirty million a year that they attribute to McAfee. So uh, on from their from their point of view, they're doing well. And this is something we've been talking about on the pod for a while, and we've both been writing about for a while. You can go direct to consumer. Uh, McAfee is using YouTube. To, to his audience. So he has the pipes. He doesn't need an ESPN or an NBC or CBS to get his uh, show distributed. He just goes to YouTube like anybody else and he can reach his fans. And then he's on a uh, satellite radio with Sirius XM, uh, which is a subscription service, but he can reach everybody. He collects all the money. No middleman. Yeah. I have two main takeaways from this deal. One is keep your eye on ESPN. ESPN next year they're going to go big into sports betting. I mean, when you're throwing around this kind of money, uh, that, that's going to be impossible for ESPN to say no. So this is going to be more than a, a simple sponsor deal. I mean, they're going, to get, they're, they're going to jump into it in a really, really big way. And I think that's going to be a, a story that both of us are going to be covering pretty hard in 2022. Yeah, two other things to watch. Uh, the NFL and other leagues are going to want more money. Uh, from FanDuel and the DraftKings of the world when they see McAfee getting 30 a year. They're going to want uh, more money. And then I think how deals are done with on-air people, like a Scott Van Pelt, okay, who I think may already have opportunities in the gambling space, but I don't know if ESPN's letting him uh, necessarily doing that do that yet. We had your, your boy Van Pelt on. Uh, I think when you look at the future, it's going to be, Here's your deal with, you know, the media company and here's your side deal uh, with the betting company that they have an association with. And I've written about this, you know, kind of bringing you in certain, not everybody, but certain personalities who have big followings, a Woj, a Schefter, maybe it's structured that way, especially uh, with ESPN and Disney possibly getting a billion dollar deals, you know, multi-billion dollar deal with one of these uh, gambling operators. Yeah. And uh, my, my second point is all of the gambling money here is making it so much easier for uh, uh, for people like McAfee or people like Barstool to sort of uh, go around traditional media, which is uh, just a, a sea change. I mean, there, McAfee could have made the safe choice and signed a deal with ESPN and been happy doing studio work and, and sort of making a name for himself. But he bet on himself and it's paying off in a huge way. I think that's a that's just a unique sea change, certainly from when, when we were getting out of college and probably from what, five to five years ago, I would say. I'm slightly younger than you, so I, maybe when I was getting out of college. Putting us in the same demo, Andrew. <laughs> All right, anyway. All right, we move to topic two. The world changing, Amazon. I wrote about this last week, getting into their own studio shows. It's very possible they're going to uh, create a full lineup of studio shows uh, with NBC Row, uh, headed by Michael Davies, which does Men in Blazers, uh, with our podcast guest, Roger Bennett, and also is responsible for Good Morning Football, which has gotten rave reviews, deservingly so. Uh, so uh, that is something Amazon getting even more into the sports space. Not a big story, right, John? Uh, oh, that's this is a sports space doing. Have you seen what afternoon shows get in terms of audiences? You have to explain this to me. If I'm Amazon and I want to get into the sports space, why am I getting studio shows? Like the, 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 even the best studio shows don't get a million viewers. Why, why wouldn't I take that and amass more live rights? That that's that to me would be the play here. I mean, you're talking about you know, hundreds of dollars to pennies in comparison, right? This isn't to get into the studio uh, sport space. It doesn't cost as much as right, right? We, it was a billion dollars plus to get the NFL on Thursday night exclusively starting next year for Amazon. To get in the studio shows, it's going to be in the millions, uh, maybe tens of millions, but millions of dollars to do studio shows. It will live on their platform. All right, so let, let, let me ask you a question because we're talking about studio shows and you mentioned Men and Blazers. You mentioned uh, Good Morning Football. 
what are we looking at here? What are the what are the studio shows going to look like? Yeah, I think if you look at what they do, I think it will be smaller spaces in terms of studio, nothing extravagant. So uh, that remains to be seen. And that's an open question of how much investment will go into this, right? Like, I think everyone read that article who's in the business is like, oh, I got, you know, I can go uh, use Amazon to get more money in, in my deal with whatever network they're at now. And that could be the case, but I'm not necessarily sure how tremendous the outlay is going to be. So uh, Amazon, again, might be dipping their toe in, but you look like a good morning football, what they did there. Is, that was a, that's a big hit. And, and now Nate Burleson has become a bigger star. They all have basically become bigger star, that whole, that whole crew. Uh, but I, I don't know the exact numbers initially, what they were paying everybody, but I, I guarantee you it was a very small uh, amount in, in, you know, in comparison to what, uh, you hear with you know Stephen A. Smith's making for doing first take at twelve million a year. So the point being is that if Amazon can get a big hit, again it's not going to be a Ted Lasso effect, but you could if you can get one big hit, one Good Morning Football, it's good for the brand. They can reach you in a lot of different ways with Alexa and Fire TV uh, and. Uh, there's just a lot of different ways Amazon can reach you where it's not just a video show, it's an audio show. Uh, and so you get one hit out of those and maybe it makes sense. And maybe finally you'll think Amazon's a big story. Well, that's the Hollywood strategy. You, you bet on a lot and you hope for, for a one hit. Final question on this topic though. When should we pitch uh, Marie Donahue on a possibly a sports media, you know, studio show, something along those lines, Andrew? First off, listen, conflict of interest, number one, as you know, John, <laughs> number two is they hate you. All right. You, they don't like you. They like me. I mean, How did you turn into the nice guy of the pod? I can't get you that. are the nice guy, but I believe in there. What like as they're a big story and you keep saying they're not a big story. I, I, I really I get the sense they like me more. Most people like you more. That is true. But that one, I think, so yeah, you can send a, send a document to them. Maybe they'll consider it. I look, Brian Selter, he's on CNN and does all these things. So maybe it's possible. I think it'd be a little bit tough for us uh, to do that. Now, by, by the way, let's see what they're offering first. Okay. 30 million and maybe we uh, do it. You know what? I'll, I'll answer the phone at 30 million. Absolutely. Okay. Fine. That, Sounds that, good. That. All right. So 30 million. You can get, you million. talk about Romo money. We want McAfee money, right? <laughs> and Marie Donnie, by the way, is heading up. Amazon's video offering on this. And she has, you know, a huge role uh, as well. She's involved in a lot of different things, but this is one of the things that she's the top person on. We move to topic three, Jimmy Pataro. Uh, he was your who's up. What are you thinking about them? ESPN spending, Bob Chapik, the whole thing. Give it to us, John. Listen, I had a predictions column that was in Sports Business Journal. And in the predictions column, I finally came out and said that I believe Disney is going to pay up to get Sunday ticket to come over. It's right now it's between Disney and Amazon. Uh, at DirecTV almost certainly is going to keep a piece of that. And the main reason is these profiles of, of Bob Chapek, he's going out there and he's publicly saying that he's negotiating for Sunday ticket and wants Sunday ticket. What CEO says, especially for Disney, says that they want something. If he doesn't get it, it's going to be egg on his face, right? I think that, you know, that that sometimes there's something that's so obvious staring at you, you, you have to look at it. And secondly, Disney is committed to spend $33 billion on content this year. I mean, if you gave me a blank check for $33 billion, I don't think I could spend that in a year. I mean, that that that's a lot of money. And you can bet that sports and Sunday ticket, they're, they're going to get a lot of that money. So I just, I think that we're really staring at a uh, an ESPN that over the next year, maybe two years, is going to continue to just drive a lot of these rights deals. Yeah, ESPN is all about streaming. I, I wrote about this in New York. Uh, they just sold uh, ESPN New York, uh, the radio station, to uh, Good Karma Brands. Uh, and they kind of, it doesn't fit in their business radio. They're still in radio, but it's really not the business. The business is streaming. Everything is about streaming for them. Uh, you look at their focus overall. It's about getting to streaming. As Steve Bornstein, former ESPN president, said last year, within the next five years, uh, they're likely going to uh, uh, go direct to consumer with the mothership as well as being on cable. Five years or so. Five years or so. Mm, I heard 
five years or less. <laughs> 60 months is a long time. Steve Bornstein, our long running uh, podcast discussion on when ESPN uh, goes direct to consumer with the mothership. John, uh, I got Bornstein on my side. They're all about streaming, all about spending money. And we see that. Uh, and, and here's okay, let's just move right into topic. And let's, you, you, you can go back to this, but let me just move right into uh, topic four. ESPN, they're going to have a Saturday doubleheader on January 8th. Uh, they announced their broadcasters for that. Regular crew uh, gets one game, Levy, uh, Greasy, and Riddick. And the other game goes to Herb Street and Fowler as the main booth. Uh, no Manning cast will also be on ABC. There'll be playoff implications. The, the first thing, let me point out, you know, you're, is that when you look at the Monday night deal that they did for this upcoming contract is kind of starting now and it'll get even Monday Night football is going to grow in prominence again in terms of the games they're going to flex schedule going forward this is better to um they previously had a game a double header that first opening weekend which was fun but it's a monday night it was always san diego la or san diego or the raiders or whoever and it was okay denver a lot i felt like uh west coast teams now you get the Saturday. There's supposed to be playoff implications. Uh, so again, that's where ESPN's focus is on live rights. You know, this is a plus for them. In terms of the NFL, they since 2006 they viewed the Monday Night Football as the cable package, and so it would get the worst games. Well, the cable package now includes ABC. Uh, this game won't include the Manning Cast, but it sometimes includes the Manning Cast. You're getting a whole lot, lot more distribution, which means you're going to get better games to get on there. It's no longer sort of like in the cable ghetto of sorts. But I have a question for you, Andrew. How committed do you think ESPN is to their main Monday night booth? Publicly, they're going to say they are. Um, they do buy themselves a little time because of the success of the Manning cast. But I, like I've said this before, I want to like Levy, Greasy, and Riddick. I just don't hear it. Um, I've talked about... Levy um, as a play-by-player, -player, he's okay, uh, but not great. He's made some pretty big mistakes this year. Uh, very good studio guy. Uh, Riddick, to me, he way too much football jargon. Uh, there was a play the other day. Kyler Murray made a tremendous pass. He was falling out of bounds. And the reaction should be all about Kyler Murray. And he's telling us uh, what the Rams' defense did wrong. I mean, I don't know what they did wrong. They Kyler Murray falling out of bounds and he made a play that I don't know if anybody in the NFL or in the world could make uh, besides Kyler Murray. And that's where the focus would be. And he's very focused on the defense every time, what they do wrong, uh, you know, and I just think there's just a lack of like chemistry with that group. And I get it. I kind of, they, they've been put in a bad spot in terms of they hadn't worked together much before. Um, and, you know, that said though, I don't think to me, Fowler and Herbstreit are not the long-term answer college guys, um, you know, if you're gonna take them off college and maybe if they don't do college at all. They're the best football group at, at ESPN, but they're they're identified with college and ESPN has gone all in with college. They have relationships with every single college conference. Yeah, so I so to answer your question, I don't see this trio, maybe one of them makes it to the Super Bowl, you know, four or five years from now, but I'm not sure if this trio is gonna make it. I think they'll uh, they'll try to figure that out uh, as they go forward to, uh, to get that even uh, better. Well, let's uh, head right into topic five. Finally, New York gets a championship, Andrew. Congratulations. Yes, NYCFC. It's over. The long wait is over for New York. Uh, all of New York was rejoicing. Not really, but NYCFC fans were excited. It was a great game. It's important. I, I, I will say if MLS becomes something even bigger one day, we'll look back and we'll say, oh, that championship, that was the first one. You know, the, if NY. CFC becomes a huge club, you know, like a Barcelona, Real Madrid. I'm not saying that big, but if one day they're like the Yankees of soccer, uh, we'll look back at this championship and, and say, oh, that's how, the, how it all started uh, in a tremendous game against Portland that went into extra time and then, and then penalty kicks is where uh, NYCFC won it. So what did you think of the telecast? You watched from start to finish, I'm assuming. Yeah, my big problem is this. And this, look, Fox does it, so it's not just ESPN, ABC. I can't understand. Maybe you can explain this to me, John. Why these places promote these games for a 3 o'clock start when kickoff is at 323? And it ended up being 333. So what happened on Saturday was 
the college women's college basketball, UConn uh, was playing. It went late. It didn't end till three fifteen. So you're promoing it for me. Three o'clock, three o'clock, three o'clock. It didn't start until three twenty three, and then you turn on at three. I don't even think they had it. They didn't have much telling me to wait. Um, if they had anything to wait uh, for, it's gonna we're gonna get to the pregame at three fifteen. To me, I, networks. I don't know why you do. It's such bad faith. People have things to do. It's just it's for, for, for getting everything else. It's rude as can be. You know, it's just not fan friendly, and it's you know they want to get they they sell advertisements for the pregame show and they want to get as many people to the pregame show. And, and they're, they're, they're answering to the sort of, you know, uh, corporate overseers rather, rather than the fans. And a theme of this podcast today is about Pat McAfee and some of these, uh, some of these streamers that are the voice of the fan. And, and, uh, you know, I'm not saying that they, that they wouldn't do some sort of shenanigans like that, but if you're a big established TV company, yeah, just tell me when the kickoff is. And if I'm really excited, I'll, I'll tune in for the pregame show. But I want to see I want to see the live game and everything pr- is predicated around the live game. So I, I, I just there's, there's not really a good answer other than money. All right, let's bring topic six in. John Oran's predictions uh, this week, they come out highly anticipated every year. What, you're not going to you're not going to take credit for my predictions, are you? No, I'm not taking credit. Not yet. Let, let's start. We'll get to that in a second. OK, <laughs> uh, but first of all, MLS, you had a prediction of where that ends up. Uh, you know, MLS was waiting for the Premier League to do its rights, uh, rights deal. It ended up with NBC. So then presumably that left Fox and CBS and ESPN like oh, waiting for it. Well, Fox has little to no interest. CBS has, you know, they're taking meetings. They have little to no interest. Uh, ESPN uh, wants it. I think Warner Media also has been, you know, uh, more than kicking the tires. They've been in, in discussions with it. So I, I think ultimately they're going to do a deal. It's going to be a deal that works. It's going to, uh, it's going to look a lot like uh, the NHL deal, the hockey deal, where it's going to be a lot of streaming on, on Hulu, ESPN plus um, Turner is going to get some ESPN is going to get some. And that's where I, I see the soccer rights landing. I don't see anybody else really coming in and, and getting it. Yeah, big advantage of this pod in terms of my reporting. I get to see where John's brain is thinking. You are all over Warner Media and Discovery spending trillions and billions and you know a lot of money, which is very interesting to me. I don't think they get it. I mean, like, I don't think MLS is a great video TV platform. You know, I think they'll get, I think they'll probably end up staying with ESPN, but not at they're gonna get more money because of how the rights are constructed with uh, you know, all the local rights, all rolled into one, but I don't think they're going to get some crazy number. I'd be surprised by that. I don't see the audience for it. Warner media. They have uh, David Zaslov when he, when he takes over from discovery, big sports fan, he's bet on sports hard in Europe. You have Jeff Zucker grew up through NBC sports is a big sports fan. They want to grow and they want to announce themselves to the business. And so they're going to be a part of every deal going forward. You give us a little, just a tiny snippet about give us Zadzlaw's background, a little bit of terms of where he's been and all that stuff. Obviously, a lot of us know who he is, but some people might not. David Zaslov, he grew up also at NBC Sports. That's where he knows uh, uh, Zucker very well. Actually, he's part of NBC Cable, but he is very in, in, involved with the Olympics back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, he moved over there to Discovery. And while at Discovery, they bought Eurosport and they really invested a lot in with, uh, with golf programming. They bought a lot of Olympic rights over in Europe, uh, cycling over in Europe. He, he sees a lot of value in live sports rights. And I think that's going to translate when he takes over to uh, Warner Media. Before we get to Jeff Van Gundy, let's just quickly go through two other predictions you had. Big 10 rights will get settled next year. Who's going to get them? Uh, I have a high degree of confidence on this prediction. The Big Ten is going to leave ESPN. Fox, which uh, owns part of uh, Big Ten Network along with the Big Ten, is going to step up and try to take as much of the Big Ten programming as it can get. Uh, You're going to see Warner Media, you're going to see NBC, and you're going to see CBS uh, bidding about each other for a a much smaller package of um, Big Ten games. CBS is going to end up getting it because they're going to need to fill that uh, at window Saturday afternoon window that the SEC is in right now. They want it. Uh, the Big Ten, Big Ten likes ESPN, but the Big Ten is viewing ESPN as a very SEC friendly uh, network, and so it, it, it wants to go somewhere like Fox and then maybe have a uh, CBS work work it as well. So that that one, I have a pretty high degree of confidence on. 
All right, last thing. Good job. I saw you predicted that Al Michaels will end up in Amazon. It's, um, I don't know where you came up with that one, but great job with that. You know, I had a source that told me there was like 92%, but I'm going to go up to 100%, okay? 100%? Well, uh, 99%. 99%. 99%. <laughs> deserve, he deserves credit. All right. Sounds good. All right, John, we bring in Jeff Van Gundy from ESPN. Uh, to me, Jeff might be uh, the best game TV analyst out there right now. He, Mike Breen, and Mark Jackson becoming a legendary team with all the finals they've done. So, Jeff, welcome. You're the big get this week on the Marsh and RN podcast. Uh, thanks for joining us. Well, if I'm the big get, I'd hate to see what the small get is. <laughs> Well, well, we've had some pretty good ones. We've had Jimmy Pataro on, Shaq. Those uh, are big gets. Yeah. Now, Jeff, we're good. pretty happy with you. All right. Now, Jeff, we had Shaq on the pod a couple of months ago, and he came up with your celebrity double. Let's give it a quick listen. Now, Shaq, I'm 5'7". I played competitively a pickup. Sure you um, did, Jeff so Van Gundy. Sure you did. <laughs> I can shoot it a little. So, Jeff, how do you feel about being compared to Andrew Marchand. Is that a compliment? Well, it would be for me. I'm not sure for Andrew. It, it, <laughs> it's like, like there is no one uglier in sport than me. I mean, think about it. Like when people say you look better in person than you do on TV, I'm like, well, what does that say about how I actually look on TV? You know, so anyway, I feel bad for Andrew. Uh, you know what? I think that's a compliment. I think he was talking about, because I was talking about how I can, you know, I'm five seven. I could shoot it a little bit, and then then that's when he dropped the Jeff Van. You could play though. Yeah, you didn't play in the NBA, but I, you were a very very good college ball player. Yeah. So Shaq obviously didn't see my work at Nazareth College. He wasn't glued to uh, the results of upstate New York uh, Division three basketball. And also, listen, Shaq. Not everyone's seven one three twenty. All right. You know, you got a couple of advantages there for the for, for playing. Hey, Jeff. You coached the uh, New York Knicks for, I think it was about 12 years, first as an assistant, then as, as a head coach. I live in D.C. I always hear about the tough New York media. What were they like to you? You know, I didn't see it um, that way at all. I actually thought the media uh, and the fans were of great help uh, to a head coach coaching a team because, for instance, for the fans, if we might have won six or seven in a row. And then we come out in a first quarter of the next game and we're down and we didn't like bring it. You know, the fans would let you know in New York. They're not like tolerating, you know, uh, lackadaisical performance. So I thought the fans did a good job. And the media, they always kept you on, on, the, on edge because like I used to always say this guy, Mark Berman, who covers the New York Post, no matter who you played in your nine-man rotation, the only people he was interested in talking to after the game was 10, 11, and 12 to see who had some complaints. So it always kept you on edge. And I, I actually like the, the banter and the give and take. And um, if you don't like that, uh, particularly back then when there was more access, uh, then it was going to be hard. But I used to like, like going back and forth with the media. I thought they were good. Did you establish good relationships with, with anybody in particular? You know what? I thought if, like, the only thing I had a problem with, John, was if they asked you a question and you gave an honest answer and then they complained about you being too honest. Like, you just asked me the question. Why would you have a problem with me telling you how I felt, even though it may conflict with what your opinion is? So, um, yeah, so... I, I didn't really, you know, you, you would see him twice a day back then. You know, you'd see him before shoot around. Well, actually three times before shoot around, before the game and after the game. And so, again, there's some guys, you know, you just gravitated to from an age standpoint or common interest that you, you know, you talk to maybe just in general more. And then there was other guys that, um, you know, would come at you harder. The guy who came at me the hardest uh, when I was in New York, no matter what, was a, a guy named uh, Kevin Kiernan. I don't know if he's still doing, uh, if he's still writing for the Post, but back then he was 
he was hammering away pretty good. Yeah, Kevin Kern. Yeah, he he left the post recently after a really great career. Um, you had some back pages, right, in your office? Oh yeah. You know, what was your favorite? Oh, without uh, without question, um, bad noose for Jeff, and they had me in a noose. I think about it, uh, how times have changed. They had me in a noose on the back page of the post. Um, uh, and then the other one I had up was Van Gandhi. They had uh, me like packing my office, you know, if I was going to get fired or not. So those were the two that stood out. The noose one probably wouldn't uh, age well in today's, today's world, but I found it like those guys who come up with that stuff on the back, uh, on the back page. I always found them to be really sharp guys. The moment you accept a job in New York as a head coach, uh, they're already talking like the next day they start, you know, I don't know if he's going to be there next, you know, next week, next year, you know, so it, it's constant refrain. And again, if that bothers you, like you're going to be miserable. Like you have to get to a point where it's just, it, this is just, it's part of the dance. You know, you lose two in a row. They're going to quote anonymous sources. Now those anonymous sources may well be players. They may well be agents. They may well be uh, the guy uh, who's selling hot dogs at the arena. You know, like they never I don't think it's the hot dog guy. Come on, Jeff. Oh, no, no. Listen, if you think that some of it isn't strictly their opinion made up that is regurgitated by a friend of theirs, and then they can anonymously source that person, <laughs> then, uh, you wouldn't make it in coaching because you have to believe that you can't believe like all of this is just constant bashing from players and agents. Now let's go to the booth now, or, you know, you're, you're, you're at midcourt for these games. So it's not really a booth, but, but when you think about working with Mike Breen and Mark Jackson for all these years, when you first got into it, did you think you'd be doing this this long? Absolutely not. You know, when I got let go in Houston coaching the Rockets, you know, uh, it was a difficult age for my children uh, if we were to move. So um, I wanted to like sort of stay in Houston, but, you know, find a job that could sort of support uh, that staying in Houston. And so I considered uh, staying with the Rockets in uh, an alternative role of uh, being a consultant. Um, but when this broadcasting opportunity came up, I, I took it without any expectation. I just knew I was going to work with, you know, two great friends. So it sounds like when you became head coach of the Knicks in the 1990s, the biggest media market in the country, you had no designs in terms of going on television, taking your career that way. Well, I don't really have the face for television, right? So no, and I, I did it once, you know, between my Knicks, when I ended with the Knicks and started with the Rockets, I went on TNT for a year and Marv Albert really pushed for that. Uh, and so I worked with he and Mike Fratello and the crazy thing, even though Marv did our games, it wasn't like we spoke often. Um, he was one of the old school guys who wanted to keep a healthy distance between um, team and broadcaster so that, you know, he could remain objective. And I didn't really appreciate it when I was a Knicks coach, because I wanted more of a homer. And, you know, I, you know, Marvin, and I, like I say, we barely spoke. And when we did, it was usually a little contentious, right? And then to find out that he actually pushed for me when we really didn't have any like great relationship or anything, um, it really meant a lot to me. And I learned so much with him and Mike Fratello so that when my Knicks, uh, when I went to the Rockets and I was done there, I had a little experience. Um, but again, I didn't have any designs on, I'm going to do this because I know I can be good at it. I sort of was in the way at TNT in that three man booth and, uh, you know, but I learned a lot. What was the contentious about with Marv? It always centered around Ewing, you know, like, uh, I didn't think he was, uh, a particularly fair to Ewing, uh, as I listened and watched the game after, you know, like you know, as you do as a coach. Sometimes I did it with the sound down, but when the sound was up. And so, you know, I didn't, I, I just didn't. And the thing I didn't understand is 
and now I do, is you just have to say what you think in those jobs. And you can't be worried about how it's going to be received. You have to try to be fair uh, and direct. And um, that's what he was as a Nick broadcaster. Uh, you know, and I thought there was like an anti Nick bias um, at times and an anti Ewing bias and a pro Jordan, pro Bull bias. But that was me as a coach. Me as the broadcaster uh, now understands that, hey, Marv was just doing his job. And whether you agree with someone or you disagree with them uh, doesn't matter. It's the broadcaster's job to say what he thinks and, and to be honest and fair. And uh, from that lens, you know, Marv, that's how he did his job. And so, um, you know, you, you're very appreciative when you have a different point of view. I think every broadcaster should have to try to coach and every coach should and and or play and every uh, coach should have to try to broadcast because then you'd have a greater appreciation for the job the other guys are doing. You know what you're doing with the media, though. What'd you call Phil Jackson? Chief Triangle? Yeah, Big Chief Triangle. <laughs> now, I mean, that's a I back gotta say, I got to say, if I had one regret, it was that. Um, not because, I mean, it was, you know, some people thought it was clever or whatever, but I never wanted, I never wanted to go at other coaches because I knew how hard the job was. And I try, even in broadcasting, um, I'm often accused of being overly pro coach, which is probably valid. Um, but that's one I do regret. And, and not because, you know, we were, you know, friendly or anything like that. It was just the opposite. But I, I thought I did myself a disservice and the coaching profession a disservice by, you know, sort of uh, making fun of another coach. But it was a pretty good line. The, it was a great line. The reason that Andrew and I both feel that you're the, the best basketball analyst that, that it, on television today is that you brought, you brought such a unique style to, to, uh, to calling games. Uh, you, you don't focus so much on the X's and O's. Your rants are, are legendary. They go viral. Who did, who did you pattern this after? I mean, is, is, is this all just you? Yeah, that, you know, I, I said it to somebody uh, a couple weeks ago. I think one of the most important things when you take a job is that someone allows you to be yourself and they don't hire you and then try to change you know, the basic core of who you are. That doesn't mean you don't take coaching in broadcasting and you don't try to improve, but the, the best thing that I had going for me uh, with ESPN is I've always had the same uh, producer in Tim Corrigan. And Tim has, you know, he, he, he says when I've gone too far or, you know, that was dumb. But he also like hasn't tried to alter like who I am. And I haven't tried to pattern myself after anybody. I, I just, I guess I think in my situation, you have it so easy. All you have to do is talk about what you see on the court. But for the most part, John, when, you, when you're allowed to be yourself, um, it allows you to try to do your job with confidence. And when you can do your job with confidence, um, you, get to, you get a chance to be as successful as you can be. Jeff, thank you very much for, uh, for joining the pod. Was it everything you were expecting? And more, because I got to say, I think people have a better chance. Your podcast is shorter, so it's good. And people won't fall asleep. Like sometimes I'm on some, like a podcast for like an hour. I'm like, who's listening after like 20 minutes? I wouldn't yeah, even, we, we, I don't we, agree with myself half the time. I can't imagine that anybody else would agree with me. Yeah, my opinions change pod to pod. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Well, we appreciate you coming on. And sorry that Shaq said that about you, but um, you know what? I, I, maybe he meant it in good fun. I know you guys had a little history, so you, can, you had history of a lot of people. That's why you're great for. Uh, that's why the whole New York media wants you back and coach the Knicks again because you you know what you're doing. You understood the media too here, where I think you got to have a little fun with it because if you take it too serious, I mean, I covered the Yankees with Joe Girardi, and 
he was, you know, polite and everything, but just was too serious about keeping everything tight. And I think it, it sort of makes it so then it falls on the players to answer a lot of questions where the coach really in this market needs to take it on himself. So the players are sort of uh, kind of bubbled off in, in my opinion. If I could give one piece of advice to any New York coach or, or any like Philly or, you know, wherever they're, they have competition is never in the, like, I hate when people would used to say one more question. I'm like, no, I'm here. Like they can ask questions for as long as they want. If they want to stay here, I'm going to talk for as long as they have questions, because just like you said, Andrew, like to me, it's, it's my job because if I leave a void, they will search out other ways to get answers to their question. Um, And then I may not like, you know, they're off the record, you know, sources. If I'm the, if I'm the guy, ask me the question, I'll answer the question. Now I may not tell you everything you want to know um i'm i'm not going to tell everything as as a head coach but I, I i thought it was my my job uh to not fill the notebooks but sit there and answer questions until no one had any more questions because i think the moment you start you know trying to pick and choose well i'm not going to answer this question or that question or you know and i think it also gives you some rope so it, on some days where you're a little bit like uh, edgy and your tone may not be great. You've built up a reservoir of pretty good will and you can answer a question like, you know, I, you might not say that's a stupid question, but you could say it in your answer. And I think that give and take, um, you know, led to, you know, there are some guys like you didn't have, again, you'd sit there and answer the questions, but you weren't going to like, go out of your way to help but there's other guys like if they called back later and said you know you have a minute i i i didn't really understand this part of your answer you would take time to explain it because it was good for them but it was also good for you and your team that whether you're right or wrong whether they agree with you or not at least they understand your your thinking and so uh i i just don't understand when people like cut the questions off. I, I just, I don't understand it. In that case, Jeff, I have one more question. Yeah. Andrew mentioned how the Knicks fans, they want you back. Do you want to get back to coaching? Well, I think coaching is, uh, you can't take the bad parts out. You know, you don't get to pick and choose. I remember Joe Torrey said this about uh, working for George Steinbrenner. He goes, you don't get to pick and choose the good parts that you like and the bad parts you don't like. You have to accept it as an entire package. And I think it's the same with the entire job of coaching. You have to accept the whole thing. And uh, you want a chance to win. You want a chance to be able to, for me, uh, control your staff. And now that's a much bigger thing in the NBA now where they don't allow you to to pick your staff. Um, Front office picks it for you, which I think leads, I think is a very poor choice by, um, I think it leads to poor staff chemistry uh, and, and these growing staffs, um, I think make it really hard to have good staff chemistry, which to me, your team chemistry will never be better than your staff chemistry. So I, I think you, you'd wanna be in charge of that. Um, and so a lot would have to fall into place, but certainly I'm not opposed to coaching. I, I, I study basketball daily. I love basketball. I love coaches and coaching. And if it comes, the right situation comes up, sure, I would do it. Thankfully, though, I've had a great job, and I still do with ESPN and ABC. So it's a lot easier to be a little bit picky about what you want in maybe a next job when you have such a great job right now. Well, Jeff, really appreciate you joining the pod. You've got Christmas Day doubleheader on ABC. Uh, games throughout the season and the NBA finals again with Mike Breen and Mark Jackson, our pleasure and uh, appreciate it. And good luck uh, in the new year. You too. Take care guys. Thanks a lot, Jeff. John, Jeff Van Gundy was great. Now look, we, we, we try to take you inside sports media. Let's take you inside the pod. Van Gundy. First off, John was slightly late, just a couple minutes. I don't know. He's getting prepared. He's got to get, maybe he's looking at my hair. 
do his hair. Um, <laughs> and then uh, at the end of the pod, I've never seen someone get off of a Zoom faster than Van Gundy. It was like, we said, thank you. I think John says, thank you, as you just heard. And then Jeff was like, out of here. No Immediately. Small. Don't you have to hit Zoom and then you get another box coming up? It's uh, unbelievable. It but I, I love that interview. I think Van Gundy is the best basketball analyst, game analyst that there is in the, in, in, on TV today. And I think it was what he said. He's just himself. And that comes through in, in, in the telecast. I just think he does a he, he does a really, really good job. He, he's excellent. Um, so uh, Jeff Van Gundy, he could get calls of the week in the future. Uh, they have the Christmas Day uh, games, as I mentioned. Uh, and you know, the NBA with Steph Curry, uh, such a big story. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to see, especially where the ratings may go this year. All right, let's go to our calls of the week. Call of the week. Why don't you lead us off, Andrew? What do you got? All right, mine's not an audio call. Mine goes to NFL Network's Tom Palisaro uh, for his story on Urban Meyer that had everyone talking uh, with Urban Meyer allegedly saying to the assistant coaches, what have you won? And going around and asking what they've won. And so we talk a lot about the value of insiders. And yeah, there I do think there's a little value in the transaction game uh, being first, especially when you surprise people uh, when something comes out of nowhere. But really what I want to know is what's going on inside. And to me, this is where the value of insiders and reporters are, is you're telling me stuff beforehand. Um, and this is good stuff. And, 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 and the one thing is weird to me is like, everyone's like, Urban Meyer is going to be terrible. I don't remember hearing that when he first was hired by Jacksonville. Everyone's like, oh yeah, we all knew he was going to be terrible. I just don't, again, I don't follow it that closely, but I just don't recall that fully. I did hear some questions about whether he can take what worked in college and make it translate to the pros like every other great college coach. But no, I, I think there's a pile on effect right now that I didn't hear when it first happened. Okay. Your call of the week. All right, my call of the week. Let's go to the Formula One Grand Prix of Abu Dhabi. Uh, after a safety period, the racers restarted for one final lap. And here's David Croft with the call. Of all the drama, of all the controversy, of all the magic moments in Formula One in 2021, it comes down to this. And at this moment, it looks like it's going to go the way of Max Verstappen. Mercedes not happy. Red Bull will be delighted. They have shared a brilliant championship battle, but the championship can only be won by one, and it's going Dutch in 2021. Max Verstappen, for the first time ever, is champion of the world. Now, Andrew, I'm not going to pretend to be the biggest uh, Formula One racing fan in, in the world. I thought that was a, a really good call. Uh, but I just want to talk about Formula One. Their media rights are up right now, uh, and they're coming off the most watched F1 season in U.S. TV history, nearly one million viewers uh, per race. And what I like about them is that they went to ESPN, didn't take a rights fee, but they bet on themselves. And that bet is going to pay off in spades when, as part, part of my prediction, that ESPN is going to renew and they're going to get a really, really healthy rights fee. Yeah, Netflix has said they may kick the tires, but uh, I doubt they'll actually uh, take the wheel. Do you like how I did that? That was awful. I like um, it. <laughs> it's like you're a writer. That's good. I don't think that was good. I don't know. You guys can decide. <laughs> All right, listen, that's going to do it. We want to thank Jeff Van Gundy for being on the pod. We're going to be back next week. We're going to be here Christmas week, New Year's week, no weeks off for the pod. Uh, we're going to look back one of those weeks, and then we're going to look ahead uh, the other week. But we're back next week with a, with a regular pod. Uh, so, John, uh, appreciate it. As always, enjoy the time with you. And we, we thank Van Gundy. If you can follow and subscribe, that would really uh, be nice and say how great it is. That's very nice. If not, don't say anything. Sports media never sleeps. Thanks. Thanks for listening. <laughs>